Hello, Rupert. Hi, Gary. Hi, you're outside. I am. That's steady. What's that blue stuff? Exactly. Look at that. <laughs> oh, is that a cloud? Is that the tree in the back? Uh, no. What, the serious tree? Yeah. No, the tree. The The big, the big problem trees in the front. Mm -hmm. That's, that's it there. Oh yeah, pretty big. Twenty meters. So we ought to turn this camera around, shouldn't I? How do you do that? You're having a garden tour. Yeah. Hi. We're looking looking at the tree. The tree. Yeah. That's the tree. That's that's the one. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. So that's reaching right under the house, is it? Ah, uh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, what do you can see? Thanks. It's interesting looking at brick wall. Um, but yeah, the um, the problem is that the roots are taking moisture from the clay, and the clay is drying out. Oh, it shrinks okay. when it dries out, and uh, mm -hmm. so a common problem in the UK and the southeast. Yeah. As we've now learnt because it's uh, clay soil on top of a. Uh, Something called mud rock, and uh, mud rock is not fully formed rock yet. Anyway. But yeah, it's a lovely day. Uh, mm. Look at that! It's a floor. bit blue oh, sky. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Oh look! Hey, so that's behind the house. That's not in the towards. Yeah, the yeah, I'm in the. In the, in the back garden there. Ah, I did the other way around and it would slope up from the house but it slopes down from the house is that right lost him oh, he's gone he's gone he's in a reverie <laughs> <laughs> how are you how are you gary um not too bad um so I'll probably have to think about that. <laughs> are, are you back, Rupert? Are you there, Rupert? No. Uh -huh. He has to go back in the house. Hmm. Looks like we've lost him. Or maybe not. Uh, the puzzled face. Okay, very specifically, have you had to shell out more money? <laughs> oh, oh, no. Oh, no. no. Oh, no. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> well, well, for the time being, you know, these things are not finished. Oh. So, <clears throat> just a matter of... Uh, Picking a strategic time and, uh, and then proceeding. Wow. We'll see. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, nothing like that. Most most of my time at the moment is involved with uh, selling islands to uh, to foreigners. So, which is quite complex. So, yeah. Selling what to uh, who? Islands. Irons. Islands. Islands. Islands, you know, the bits of land. Yeah. You're selling islands? islands? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm doing the con uh, selling in some cases or conveyancing more than often, more often than not. Basically, it's uh, sitting between the, the broker or, or sellers and uh, the buyers and doing all the 
um, and balancing work to make sure that nobody gets ripped off. We wouldn't want that. Oh, no. So you're selling them to rich oh, foreigners? Oh, oh yes. You, well, well, people who intend to set up, you know, resorts and, and things like that. That's interesting. So they will set up exclusive resorts on these islands? Well, exclusive if, if you've got the money, yes. <laughs> if you can afford to stay there, then you can book it, yes. But, but yeah, they are, they are very high end and that they're in areas which are extremely isolated, uh, which, which wow. means that you, know, you, you need to be fairly determined to, to get to these sorts of places. And um, so what, what, what attracts them there? Natural beauty. You know, the, the seas, um, the environment. It's extremely picturesque in, in some, of, some of the islands around, around here. So, so that's what I've been, been doing mainly. Right. So are they mainly to individuals, like they bring their family there? Uh, no, or usually, are they usually, uh, mainly resort, you know, whether they want to build a hotel complex there? Well, they, they may well want to bring their families, but it's usually an investment, you know, and usually involves companies, various prescriptions. So basically investors, but, you know, certainly there's, you know, there are individuals, but, you know, individuals by themselves can't own islands anyway. Um, they have to do it through an Indonesian company. So that, yeah. So yeah, it's not just for private islands. It's, it's it has to have some sort of uh, use value. Wow. So so, uh, how did you feel about um, the last um, session? <laughs> can you can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Oh, okay. Good. I, so I, you go the... first. You go you go first. Uh, yeah. Because I, I don't like to hear. Before what... we lose <laughs> you again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've moved slightly closer to the house, so it, I think it might have been the Wi-Fi that went off, although I should have 4G, but anyway. Um, what did I think? Uh, I missed the bit where he said you had to learn 32 dimensions of awakening. Um, you missed I only that. Saw that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I switch off after the, after the breakout. I don't, the Q&As are a waste of time for me. So... Um, I didn't get that bit. I didn't get the bit at the end. So when I read it, I thought, well, no, actually, I'm not going to do that because that's just crazy. And uh, I thought, and Phoebe, <laughs> Elfie brought this up in our, our uh, study group about being the person you want to be. And I, you just thought, what? It's, it's just bonkers. Um, so I th I'm a bit lost. I thought, as I've been saying, that I sort of assumed that this first semester was about bringing people to the position that we were at the end of our course. And I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, certainly, we don't seem to be at that position. If anything, we seem to have reverted to a more Buddhist, not doctrine, but a, certainly a Buddhist doctrine in, in a bachelor speak. Um, and whilst he has been referencing other interesting things um, like Socrates and Epicurus and Keats and so on, I, I'm less convinced that he's really pushed on from a position where, yes, Gossamer had some really good ideas, but so did lots of other people. Um, because there doesn't seem to be a tendency with people in the group to have said, ah, yeah, this is a sort of, yes, we, we need to move on from 
from Buddhist orthodoxy. Anyway, that was my take on it. So I was a little frustrated, disappointed, confused. Well, it would have been a nice thing, you know, that would have meant that in what happened in our course, which I think was very different from what happened in the first course, uh, was really a stepping stone for him. And I'm not sure that that is so. And um, it turns out for me that he that the first semester was about preparing for the second semester, not bringing people to where we were at the end of our course, yeah, but right. to, to prepare for the second semester. And I mean, that stark demand, like learn those 38 things by heart, um, is, at, at, so he wants to, I, th I think that it must be, I don't, well, mustn't. Uh, I would assume that he wants to very fluently move between those 38 things and wants instant recognition in his pupillage <laughs> um, so that he doesn't have to spend any time on uh, explaining where he is in it. That What else can there be the reason? They are not a good map for uh, uh, doing your flourishing life as a as a kind of a road map oh here we go you know now left now right it's it doesn't work like that it's only ever good as a kind of review mechanism um so but as a review mechanism i don't really need to learn them by heart I think it might for me it would be more useful if I sat down with it and and read a little bit about it and 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 contemplated in that way that would be my review mechanism maybe people have different ones but so I I just think he wants us to be very fluent with it so that when he says and Socrates says and think of um, the ninth of the 38, uh, and can you see the parallel? I, I, I would imagine something like that. Don't know. Gary. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Gary, what's, what's the, th well, yeah, I said I, they're 32 actually, not 38, but never mind. Oh, but God. <laughs> I, I memorized that bit. Yeah, well, 32 is a good binary number. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> So what what is it? It's, it's, it's two bytes. It gives, gives you a thirty-two bit word, um, which gives you whatever it is to the power of ten numbers. Um, but, but yeah, I think one of, one of the problems. I mean, that there is still that you know, the, the biggest issue in in the course is is of course the. Um, the, the Buddhists or, or the people who are just so orientated towards Buddhism that they just can't sort of let that go. And, you know, the, it, it may be that, that, that they're, not, they're not the majority, but they're just perhaps the most vocal and the most learned um, who are actually, you know, vocalizing. <clears throat> and uh, and not, not to sort of uh, also uh, underestimate the number of what, what, could, what could you call um, wokest? Um, usually, you know, white middle-aged woman who with, with some sort of uh, racial guilt complex. So, you know, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 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 yeah. Thank God I'm uh, not middle-aged uh, anymore. <laughs> indeed, so, so obviously I wasn't referring to you. Um, so, but, you know, in general, I think the, the general sweep of, of his approach, I, I, I agree with. Uh, and what I think he's trying to do is now get, get you know, from, from the historical and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and doctrines of the past and trying to sort of pull them into a, a framework that is sort of, you know, similar or, or has, uh, you know, um, correlations 
with the the, the, the Buddhist template, um, and and this is typically like like speaking rhetorically about history and 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 culture and, and philosophy is is relatively easy, but to actually create something is much more difficult. And I think you probably started out with this 32, whatever it is, I forget what they are. They're called um, Dimensions of Awakening. Okay, yes, Dimensions of Awakening. Um, I mean, for me, that, that's really I'm, just... I'm the only one who's memorized anything here. Yeah, <laughs> have you noticed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I think that's just an attempt to try and sort of bridge sort of the the, the world of, of, of lists and and and... and uh, the Buddha's Dharma into some contemporary language. And uh, in effect, what he's trying to do almost is to define the Dharma. Ah. To define the Dharma. Yes. Ah. That's, that is, yeah, is, yeah. In effect, what, what those uh, 32 watch call it's all about. Uh, so, and you know, I, I have no particular objection to that, and, and I think you know it's easily criticised for say, you know, and just to sort of say, well, you know, to sort of you know belittle it because it's sort of you know it's all this, but but you know from Stephen's perspective, he's trying to sort of draw from from his lifetime knowledge and put it into some context that other people like him might well uh, have some congruence with, and uh, but yeah, but you know what. So you know, I, I'm I'm sympathetic towards his effort, but you know, it, it's um, it, it's possibly not the right way to go. But you know, it, it might be a way to go, and and it could could be sort of you know uh, refitted and uh, rejigged or or completely redone. Uh, but you know, as, as a basis for discussion, I think it, it, it's it's fun. It's just a it's a start. But you know, where where it goes, I think it would have to be you know uh, something considerably better than that and more coherent than that. That's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't seen it in that perspective, and it makes more sense, mm. um, particularly if he is he's trying to say, well, yeah, this is the Dharma. And so it's more of a halfway stage of bringing people. It's not. It's not where we were, but maybe yeah, yeah maybe it has a, has some validity from that point of view. I feel less um, lost now. Has been very helpful, Gary. For me too. Oh. I I totally see that too. Okay. I'm, I'm less in opposition now. <laughs> well, well, you know, all, all this, of course, is you know, has I guess a dependency on 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 people's willingness to to be flexible and to and to uh, to branch out. And you know, I guess we'll have to see what sort of uh, flexibility this this uh, model has and whether it can be um, utilized or whether it needs to be completely revamped and. You know, I think that it's just, it was like his, his Ten Commandments in the, in the art of Buddhism, um, you know, which once again sort of leaned on a, on a you know, uh, Abrianic sort of background of having sort of the Ten Commandments and all that. That, that, that was not, uh, you know, that, I think that was sort of deliberate. But, but yeah. nonetheless, I mean, it, it was once again completely inadequate. But at the same time, this is part of a creative process. When you when you when you start to be creative, things get more difficult. It's 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 you know, much easier to be a historian than, than someone who actually makes history. So that, that's sort of the difference. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that the act of creation is a difficult one. And so if if we see this as a as a starting point for you know um, you know some 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 major surgery and, and, and restructuring, <laughs> then, you know, that could happen too. But, you know, there's, there's also other things that could happen. And this is probably where I'm getting get, get back to the model of the of open source, um, you know, where, you sort, where somebody sort of posts up a, uh, a program or a document, someone comes along 
uh, suggests additions or changes to the text. Those are either um, accepted or rejected by the, by the gatekeeper for that particular um, um, site. And, and if you don't like it, you fork it. You do what, as they say in, in, in uh, IT, you know, you fork off. Um, you, know, you, you take everything that's been open sourced on that page and read you get yourself and then see if anybody else then sort of hops on your version and, and starts to develop it and change it. And this is sort of a, the, the open source way of, 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 of you know, generating programs, scripts and documents and all sorts of other protocols and all sorts of other things. Um, so, you know, uh, but I'm, Use, I'm just using, not sure. Using that mm -hmm. model though, I mean, I, I understand that. And using that analogy, I, my question is, would you start from here? Uh, when, you, when you have source code and somebody adds or changes, what is the significance of the original? Well, the original, it's, it's in some ways giving, giving it provenance that any changes that, that happen from that point on, can, you can point to a, a provenance you know, through the various branches of, of, of a particular um, branch of a, of a, of a version. Um, so, so even if you sort of took that original and then sort of you know, forked it off to a, to a new version of, that, that you were going to be the gatekeeper of, uh, then you sort of, you know, the first change you made was to sort of you know, massively restructure the whole lot. I mean, that, that still is a continuation because there is a, even if you sort of make massive changes, it's still sort of uh, reliant on or, or, or is taking part in, in the, the dialogue or discourse about, about, uh, about that particular topic. Right. Okay. No, that's, uh, that's, that's okay then. Because the big thing for me is that all of this stuff, these 32 dimensions of awakening, are words which have derived in some format or other from Buddhist doctrinaire and doctrine. It must be because we have no idea what Gautama said other than what people said he said. And so we, we can't assume that this is what Gautama would have wanted. We can only think that this is what other people who were for whatever reasons, have decided that this is what somebody said. And I don't have much confidence in it. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me if I just come at it from, an, from a 21st century, reasonably well-read, educated person looking at it and saying, well, this is a model for your life. This is a roadmap for your life. And I'd look at that and I'd say, yeah, really? Why? What, what's, in what sense does this make sense? Because it's just a bunch of words um, with some vowels in it, um, which are self-contradictory, um, obviously deliberately. Uh, and I'm thinking, well, oh, it's just all a bit, um, all a bit bizarre. It's, it's a bit avant-garde. Um, the only way it makes sense is if I've got a Buddhist background. So I've, I've got to have come from a, a position where I think Buddhism is essentially a good idea. So it's. So for me, I mean, the, we have said this before. I mean, the, there's, there's two big things that it it, it excludes. Yes. It, it excludes yes. it excludes science completely. Mm. It excludes what we know about the nature of human being. Thank you. They're, they're just not there. Mm. And it excludes, although he's now trying to retrofit um, creativity into it because he didn't have this before but he's now got a word that means creativity and there are now four bits of what make up creativity the first one is intent can't remember what the rest are but that is not the model of 
creativity that comes from uh, modern psychology. That's not how creativity works from the people who have looked at it and have analyzed it. And, you know, they, so he's got a different model of, of creativity because it happens to fit with Buddhism. So it's my question is, why would I start from here? Um, and I'm starting from here because Stephen thinks that we can fit a Buddhist doctrinaire model into this is how is a, the best way to, to be. This is the of a model, a roadmap for life. And I just don't see it. It seems there's a long way off. Well, I guess this is one of the dangers of, of, of um, you know, ascribing to the, you know, to Gautama's uh, uh, dharma, you know, a sort of completeness and and, uh, uh, and divine nature, which it simply doesn't have. Um, and of course, you know, as we've already talked about, perhaps it's incompleteness, um, in particular for a modern age, um, you know, a, a modern age demands a, a modern dharma, uh, not not sort of a dharma couched in in the language and concepts of two thousand five hundred years ago. You know, but but at the same time, sort of you know, learning from those particular traditions, uh, but but not sort of giving them the sort of status which you know. Um, too many people give to them, and this is this is a problem. You know, this is a religious problem. Of course, the religious mind wants to attach themselves to those sorts of aspects, you know, the divine aspect or the Superman aspect or, or things like that. <clears throat> um, and there's also the aspect of uh, Orientalism, um, which you know, I think probably infects uh, most of the people doing the course at the moment, I would guess, that there are a form of Orientalism which sort of thinks of Eastern religions as somehow superior and, uh, and, and mystical in some secret way. Uh, you know, that, that sort of uh, magical, it's, part, you know, it's magic, partly magical thinking, but, you know, sociologically, we, we think of it as... Uh, Orientalism, but, but uh, where was I going with that? Don't know. Wow, well, I'm I'm Thank glad you, you said that. <laughs> I, I, you you you're clarifying my mind a lot this morning. Thank God this evening for you. <laughs> I know you're pulling a lot of things together that are meaningful to me. Yeah, yeah. Mm. There's all that. So. You know, that a while ago, we discussed that. How do we define the Dharma? And so how would you then say uh, is the relevance of this effort to define the Dharma? Is it, would we have, um, you know, how, I guess when we asked that question, we, we did, we wouldn't have, put it into this Buddhist language, would we? I mean, we might might we have held held on to the to the four tasks maybe because they make a good skills based foundation, perhaps. Which is yeah, pretty uh, much absolutely. just that kind of um isn't this just a big version of that? And therefore not that far apart from what we might have had we pursued in our endeavor i think i well, think it's just gone are... the wrong way it's just gone more complicated when it actually was getting simpler i mean the, the big deal for me about the four tasks is the one task and that is the, of recognizing reactivity 
and whether you can part of recognizing it is your ability to be able to diminish it um and part of it is that you recognize that life is life and this just happens and it's not you it's not your life it's just life it's not you that's going to do a great deal about it things happen and that that is all really around one thing it's, it's about our, our reactivity to stuff and, that, and that's really valuable and absolutely it's become for me pretty much essential but it's a it's like you say it's a skill and it's it's great but i wouldn't if i was talking to somebody about it who wasn't didn't know anything about buddhism i wouldn't you and i don't when i do talk about it i don't use buddhist terms at all because it wouldn't make any sense for them i, I wouldn't call them truths or tasks i'd just say and explain through example what reactivity is and they say oh yeah yeah that happens to me i said well it is possible to to diminish it you could try this and it was you know, that that actually worked and that's got i mean you could say it's got stuff to do with buddhism because it, it it's in it's got the same root but in way of explaining it and making it useful to somebody who hasn't got a clue about buddhism it's it's pointless so i just don't think that those 32 I'm memorizing them. I'm memorizing them. Much easier. We want, you know, we want practice skills. We don't want to memorize stuff. Well, right? oh, I don't. Well, there, there it's is just too wordy. Yeah, there? Well, cert certainly it's too wordy. But but there is. I, I think it's harking back to to the benefits of memorize that memorization gave him as a, as a monk, uh, because you know, and that, that's something in Asia that that you really get is a lot of memorization. Uh, you know, Westerners call it rote learning, uh, but in, it's very, very prevalent here. Um, people remember things a lot in Asia a lot better than, than uh, most most Westerners, just because they practice memorization. Um, so, so you know, it, it's something that you know you, you have to you do actually have to practice doing, I guess. Um, so I think I think it was just sort of remembering that and, and perhaps remembering how you know useful some of his uh, um, uh, memorizations were um, and, and you know and how easy it was to sort of you know in in certain situ situations sort of have a have a, a fast reference to uh to, to those sorts of um, um structured lists but yeah but nonetheless i mean I'm still not a great fan, and I'm certainly not going to memorize it. Uh, so, but I can I can see why he might do that. And once again, it's possibly just a bridge for those you know, in, in in that Buddhist camp um, who want something to sort of bridge them over into the into a modern Dharma. Hmm. Yeah, it's not a very good defense, but it's. I think it's you know one that can stand up for the time being until we start pulling it apart. So. Yeah, I mean, the, I guess that the way that you know I've been thinking about the the, the Dharma recently is is I guess, I guess sort of a three part um, structure where where you know. The basic characteristic is is compassion, and I, I think you know most people say, well, that's a given. Uh, but, but I would you know, seriously argue that that it's not. You know, it's not a uh, it's not innate to, to 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 it may be innate for for many humans, but it's not necessarily the only game in town. Uh, you know, greed and selfishness are also a pretty good uh, you know adaptive move. I, you know, in some people's minds, uh, so you know, having that as, as uh, recognizing that as, as the basis of, of, of a dharma, um, as, as compassion as opposed to any other particular quality, 
um, especially not those which we would consider be, to be negative. Uh, I think that's you, you, the, the, the first start before you sort of get, it, get into all these lists. So you, you basically have a, a universal property, compassion. That, that's, that's, just, that's always the starting point, as far as I can see, um, in a, both for yourself and for others. But you know, further going sort of down the, the structure, then, then I would sort of think, you know, you have the, the three skills in, that, that are, uh, you know, that correspond with the, the, the first three tasks, for example. Uh, the, these are the, the these are the skills that that that, that, that a dharma could poss possibly have, and then then you have after that the ethical dimensions, you know, um, um, you know, situational ethics and the ethics of uncertainty. That's the way I sort of structure it in my own head, you know, which obviously going to be subject to change, but they have sort of a you know thirty two words in a. In a uh, I mean, it might work, uh, but but I think it sort of misses something and makes it does make it too complex. I was reading something the other day. Um, I was listening. I was when I was painting the hall. I was listening to the history of England uh, as an audio book. Which is quite interesting because there's stuff I didn't know. Me. But the the from this discussion's point of view, it talked about in the 17th and 18th century in England, particularly in the 18th 1700s, there was a um, development of uh, novelists and a, a, a rising, mainly female. And there was a, a huge interest in the novel. Lots of people could read, lots more than I thought could. And there was, and they were avaricious for novels. And the, it was quite a, a quick comment, but the, the, the author was saying that the novel changed the nature of the self. For an awful lot of people because novels make internalized selfness so you can see other people you can get other people in your head and they become much more individuals and i i thought about that and i just thought that is a really interesting perspective because before you read novels before you see things from other people's perspectives in such graphic and intense detail do you have the same sense of self and i think it's quite likely that like any practice it does practice and enhance a sense of self so i'm not sure that in gotama's time the idea of individuality or the self was as strong as it is for us who are conditioned by things like novels and, and latterly in film um, or because we, we see a lot of it. Now, up until then, your entertainment would have been music, which isn't self-based, painting, which isn't self-based, sculpture which isn't because you're looking at things and plays and plays are the only one where you could have there's some sort of similarity but really you're watching something it's not in your head it's outside whereas a novel is in your head anyway i just thought i don't know whether anybody else has come across that theory well, well i think this is you know I've always maintained that the influence of text over over discourse is, is you know has affected this, the discourse. Um, you know, we weren't really a a text based culture you know, even a few hundred years ago. You know, the, for the vast majority of people, it was just you know um, 
you, know, you just did things orally. But, you know, once Gutenberg got underway, in the, what was the 14th century or whatever, um, a much more your status was given to the text by, by a great many more people. Yeah, I, 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 it's it's not so much the text, although that obviously that that leads to it. It's this idea of a novel, mm. which, which didn't that... exist prior to the seventeenth century, as mm. as a well, as an the, art form. The the, the inner life was invented virtually by Descartes in the seventeenth century. It was invented. He posed that we have a little me in here. Before, that was not well defined and not important because we were creatures and you know, created things by God. And we were under a lot of outside influences, like with the, the Greek, um, the, the Greek myths. The where where the gods come in, you know, where we get overtaken by um, Aphrodite or Hera or whatever. So it, it it was much more of a thing that that uh, welled up in a in a be human being, but not to do with self, but to do with circumstance. You know, in which God beset you at the time much more. That's why you know, when, when you look at how they made sense of it all, it was much more other influences than internal life. That, that, uh, that uh, I, it wasn't that there wasn't an internal life. Everyone has, a, and, and our human beings have a sense of I, but they, were, they had demons, you know, in, or, or, or devils or, or angels, or there were all these outside influences that were causing uh, my reactivity, not internalized as me as a self creating all this. I think that is a phenomenon of Western 17th century thinking as defined by Descartes. And I think we've never recovered from it. And absolutely, the the Buddha uh, had not did not have that. You know, he had Mara visit all the time, which is again this outside demon, demonic force. Uh, he didn't say, "I have these things." It's a Mara comes upon me. You know, this is an outside thinking rather than an inside thinking. So I I totally agree that this the novel comes with the invention of internal meaningful life. That that I would I would agree with that. And then with this non-self and self is is, is in a completely different context than what it would be after the, the 16th, 17th century, when this becomes a real problem. Because then, you know, the self is everything we care about. Um, and so I can't just let that be. I don't think it was so problematic for people beforehand to have a self or not a self. Because it, well, it wasn't, so, wasn't so defined, not so not so totally internally determined. Yeah, and if, if that's the case, then it changes the nature, it changes the whole nature of, of Buddhist practice because you're starting from a different position. A 21st century person is not the same type of person as a person at the time of the bottom of 3000 years BC, I think it's, it's a, definitely a, not. So you can't use. So it's just, you know, what you've got, I think is therefore you should be very careful about thinking of what lessons there are to learn from a, a doctrine of that era. Very careful, but it might be very meaningful because it might go get you back to where we might have an easier time with ourselves 
because it's a bit out of kilter to be so self-ish. Um, uh, and, you know, you need to read Heidegger to come out of it as a modern <laughs> Westerner uh, and, and uh, be even alert. For me, it was like that, that there was another way of, of seeing what it is to be a self um, and then appraising what someone like the Buddha or the early the Greeks might have thought of being a self and seeing that in a different light, understanding it completely differently and, and taking that aboard as maybe a more wholesome um, uh, looking at, at what it is to be a human being, what it is to be a self. And then you be, might be really happy with having skills rather than beliefs. That's a major step in that, I think. In, in our, Gary, in our study group, um, when um, Rupert offered that again, that we were rather fond of seeing the four tasks as skills, the, the Buddhist fraction was not happy with that, actually, because mm -hmm. they feel that that's not strong enough not big enough that is just a, a skill it i mean and then really what's most astonishing one of them said well that would be i guess it would be like the skill of a woodturner which bizarrely is exactly what mm -hmm. the buddha says but he mm -hmm. said it as a no that can't be because that's minor that is just completely not up to the task and i suddenly understood that that wouldn't do for someone who is after a belief. Because yeah, I was amazed skill... when he said that. <laughs> I know, I think he, said, he noticed it's just mid a skill. You think just a skill? Just what? a skill, exactly. Just... How could you use those two words in the same sentence? It's like, <laughs> wow. Well, there you have it. If you have either you know, gotten something out of Heidegger or understand that this selfing is a modern invention, then, um, then the skill is your highest thing, I think. As a human being, having a skill, top notch. That's as far as it goes. I want it. Uh, but if you coming from a Buddhist, self-oriented belief system, a skill won't do it. You have to have the belief, the conviction, the absolutely sure-footed um, orientation never leaving you, the inside transformed, the arhant. There you have it, you know. You are, yourself is reformed. Whereas, I guess, what, what, what I would be about is, well, you know, can, can good deeds come out of me? Is, a, is good deeds on my path? Hopefully more rather than less. So it's, it's, a, it's a completely different orientation. I think that's very, very clear for me now that that has made it made a lot more sense of but i was trying to work out what was going on when he when you know he said it's like i don't think skill is strong enough mm. i think is what he actually said and i'm thinking mm. blimey there's something stronger than skills and you're thinking what, what's that then and uh, and you're right belief is stronger is it i don't know god i don't have for, any so i don't know but for a self, belief would be much stronger than skill. Absolutely. For for a Cartesian person, belief is everything. For a Heideggerian person, skill is everything. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's very, well. It's very interesting. It's because you're just trying to, you know. For me, reactivity, the, the... sorry, you've all disappeared. Can you hear me? You yeah. can hear you, but not see you. All ah, right, okay, let me see if I can get back. It's because I'm on my phone, so it might be. Well, as long as we haven't lost you, that will do. Oh, okay. I just imagine you <laughs> creatively. <laughs> there we go. Uh, 
Can I just say I'm so glad I have these meetings with you. I sort yeah, yeah. my head out big time. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. After Saturday and then Tuesday, I'm just thinking, whoa, where? What's going on? I'm just, I'm desperate for, for Gary and Elfie, come help. Help me. <laughs> well, Gary really helped me out today. Yeah. <laughs> well, you I both really helped me out. So that's great. And you're, well, you're looking Rupert, after that, me. That that novel thing is absolutely it. I think that's that's so mm. clarifying, isn't it? For me. Mm. Mm. But it's yeah, I think it it makes a lot of sense if that's the case. Because for me, the reactivity thing is a skill. The the ability to be able to see something that I couldn't see before I've learned it and I've learned a bit about I can recognize it stand back watch and accept and realize and, and it's a skill and it, it is hugely important and I can't think you know it's it's a life-changing skill and I but it sure the hell isn't a belief so yeah that's very that's very interesting and I can see why if you are centered around a belief that Buddhism will cure you, will create something, then yeah, you have to hang on to Buddhism. So it's a it's a particular mindset, isn't it? It's a Um, I'm going to have to go. I've got a group call. Okay. Coming well, that's been very useful. Thank you very much, both of you. You're, yeah, you're, me too. You're my Thank saviors. You so much. Yeah. Uh, just this weekend, there's self and non-self with John Peacock. Just saying. I'm going to listen yeah. to that. Because oh, good. Well, report back. Yeah, I will report back. Right. Because John Peacock is uh, is hot on Heidegger, and he will have some. He's often much more wider, freer than Stephen. So um, I, I'm looking forward to hearing his take on it. Hmm. Great. I'm I'm going to have to go. I've got uh, people calling me in for a, oh. another group chat. But hmm. Not a nice one. Not a nice one. So I'm oh. Gonna... Well, good luck. <laughs> okay. Good luck. Well, I hope hopefully it all goes well. So I'll I'll leave you behind and uh, make sure. Again I'll just look at the. Look, there we have the Hastings blue. Uh, Hastings <laughs> blue. Oh, <laughs> we are impressed. <laughs> uh, okay, all okay. the best to you, you Gary. Gary, thank okay. you. Thank you. Oh, bye.